Hello and welcome back once again. So right now we are discussing about the interactions between solute atoms and dislocations with regard to the physical metallurgy of aluminium alloys when you have a solute atom in, in solutions. So you have seen an interaction between a solute atmosphere and the dislocations. And such interactions will affect the mechanical behavior of the material. So let us discuss one such effect. You might have heard of yield point phenomena, especially in steels. which is basically a result of interaction between the solute atoms and dislocations. Okay. So we have already talked about, uh, you know, such interactions leading to strengthening, but uh, this kind of interactions might also have some other effect, as I said. Especially with regard to plastic deformation. Okay. So if the solute atoms can catch hold of the dislocations during the deformation process as the dislocations move, then they will basically pin down the dislocations and the dislocations will find it difficult to move unless the stress is raised again. And that is how the yield point phenomena comes into play when the solute atoms will first pin down the dislocation. That is what is known as the upper yield point. And as you raise the stress, the dislocations will be able to break free from the solute atoms. And that is when, you know, the stress kind of drops a bit because now the dislocations can move. So that's your lower yield point. And this continues uh, giving rise to that uh, yield point phenomena, right? And you have a yielding in which you will have uh, this kind of uh, serrations coming because of this upper and lower yield point coming back and forth, okay? So this is due to the fact that uh, there is an atmosphere of uh, solute atoms around the dislocations. And as a result of that, the dislocations are pinned down and their motion is hampered unless the stress is raised again. Okay, and this happens uh, repeatedly, and that is how you get, get this yield point phenomena or this yield point elongation in this particular region. Okay. So this you would have seen in uh, some kind of steels where carbon and nitrogen atoms are responsible for that, for, for this phenomena. But this may also happen in other alloys such as aluminum alloys, okay? And that is why this is relevant for this particular course also in which we are dealing with uh, aluminum alloys, okay? So a similar effect of uh, yield point phenomena can come into play due to the atmosphere of uh, solute atoms which build around the dislocations. 
and this phenomena is known as strain edging. So in this case, in, in this uh, phenomena, as you could see, there are two terms, right? One is strain. That means I have loaded the material and it is actually deforming. And the other one is aging. That means I am aging the material for a certain period of time. after it is loaded. So aging after loading and not only that it also involves reloading and that is what we need to see as to what will happen when you reload after a certain period of aging which was allowed after loading the material to a particular stress and then you know unload it so now after the aging period if you reload it what is going to happen that is what we are trying to understand and the phenomena is known by this name strain edging okay so what basically i'm talking here is this let me try and illustrate that with this plot with this stress strain diagram So as I said, first we are loading the material uh, all the way to the end point. And as it reaches the upper end point, uh, it is unloaded. Okay. So it is loaded till the point C and then it is unloaded. CD is the unloading path, okay, which is kind of parallel to the elastic portion of the stress strain curve. Okay, elastic portion is the AB. Right, so now what I'm saying is I'm going to age this. I'm going to allow some aging after the loading. Okay. So if I age this material for uh, Sometime, let's say a few hours, and then reload it. Okay. So, this time that I am allowing, you know, that is what is known as aging. Okay. So, now if I reload this, uh, this is how it will behave when the aging period is only in hours. Uh, this will simply follow this. Uh, path again as you load it you know this will go elastically all the way to C and after that uh, it will start deforming start deforming plastically right so what I mean to say here is there is no end point appearance here
it will simply deform uh, elastically till the point C and beyond that it will start deforming plastically and the yield point does not appear. Okay. So this will happen if the aging period is uh, not very long. It is only within hours. But if that happens for few months, if the aging is allowed to happen for some months, then uh, this behavior is going to change. Okay, if the if the aging period is in months, okay, and in that case, uh, you are going to see something like this. So this was the loading unloading first as we have discussed and now if you reload after aging for months then unlike the previous case you will see the yield point will reappear but at a higher stress like this okay so now the yield point will move from C to another point, let's say E, okay, which is at a higher stress. Okay, so due to this uh, strain aging, you can see the yield strength of the material uh, has increased. And this is again due to the fact that uh, during this aging period, solid atoms have diffuse to the dislocations and they are pinned down. Okay, so that is why this time is needed because the solid atoms have to diffuse and you need to allow that time for the solid atoms to reach the dislocations and once uh, they do, they will pin down the dislocations and as a result you need to apply a higher stress for the dislocations to move and that is why uh, this yield point is reappearing at a higher stress. Okay, This does not happen when you do the aging for hours because that is that time is not enough for the solid atoms to you know move all the way to the dislocations because here we are talking about aging it at room temperature okay i should have mentioned that before but anyway uh, this aging was done at room temperature for both the cases and since it is diffusion it is uh, temperature dependent so if this aging is done at a higher temperature then uh, the yield point will reappear faster right because diffusion is a thermally activated phenomena and as you increase the temperature diffusion becomes faster and as a result of that for higher temperature aging the yield point will reappear faster okay so this is a temperature dependent phenomena okay so this is not only about the interaction between the solute atoms and the dislocations but it is actually about the build up of a solute atmosphere around the dislocation and this particular phenomena is time and temperature dependent as we have already discussed just now. If you increase the temperature the time needed for the solute atoms to move to the dislocation decreases and you will have a faster build up of solute atmosphere around the dislocation.
Okay, so uh, there was a theory which has been proposed to explain this uh, solid atmosphere buildup and its relation with the time and the temperature. And it was proposed by two persons, Cottrell and Bilby. And therefore, the theory goes by this name Cottrell Bilby theory of strain aging. It basically talks about the time temperature dependence of the solid atmosphere that builds up around these locations. And as a result of that, you know, the deformation behavior of the material changes. Okay. So let us talk about this theory as to you know how it can explain that time and temperature dependence. Okay. So dislocations move on the slip plane, we know that. And here we are talking about uh, the solute atoms trying to catch up with the dislocations as they move. Okay. So let us try and depict that uh, through a diagram like this on uh, polar coordinates. So let's say I have uh, a solute atom over here and uh, this is the slip plane on which the dislocations move. The solute atom is sitting over here and let the distance uh, between the dislocation and the solute atom BR. Okay. And theta is the angle between the R and the slip plane on the right of the dislocation. Okay, so what we are trying to understand here as to how this uh, solute atom will move towards the dislocation, okay, and what will be the time and temperature dependence of this movement, okay. So in order to understand, we have to first uh, see the interaction between the solute atom and the dislocation as we have been discussing. So let's say this interaction energy is U. And here we are talking about an interaction between a solute atom and an edge dislocation. Considering this diagram, this interaction energy is given as follows. A sin theta by R, where A is the interaction constant. And with the help of this uh, interaction energy, you know, and this expression that we have derived uh, based upon this diagram, we can actually figure out how the uh, solid atoms will move, okay? Because for every fixed value of U, this equation will yield a set of circles 
passing through the dislocation line okay so if i want to show that it can be illustrated uh, through a plot like this when you consider the values of u Okay, so this is the slip plane as we have already seen before along the x-axis, right? So here you have the edge dislocation somewhere here. So as I said, for each value of u, this particular equation will yield a circle which will pass through the dislocation line. Similarly, on the opposite side also. Because u can have positive or negative values. And depending on that, uh, these circles can be either above or below the dislocation. And these lines are known by a particular term. These are known as equipotential lines. Which represent a particular value of u. Okay. And what else uh, does it tell you? It also tells you that uh, there is a variation in the interaction energy from one circle to another. And that is why they have you know different diameters the largest value of u corresponds to the smallest circle And as the value of u decreases, you have bigger and bigger circles as you can see from here, okay? So due to this energy gradient that you have, you know, this variation in the energy, due to that energy gradients, uh, the solid atoms will experience a force. Let us call that F. And due to this force, the atoms may experience a drift velocity.
which is given by the Einstein equation. So, if this uh, drift velocity due to the force is B, it is related to the force by the Einstein equation, which is given as follows. where d is the diffusion coefficient diffusion coefficient of the solid atoms k is the Boltzmann constant and t is the absolute temperature Right, so this energy gradient uh, will provide a drift velocity to the solid atoms for them to move, right? And anything which deals with the movement of atoms in the lattice will be related to the diffusion coefficient and that is why D is uh, over here. So D basically describes the atomic mobility. that is the back and forth uh, jump of atoms between the adjacent uh, vacant sites okay and if you are talking about an interstitial uh, solute atom here so this atomic mobility is about the back and forth jump of atoms of the interstitial atoms between the adjacent interstitial sites right and how this atomic jump depends on the temperature and this energy gradient that you have you know depending on that the behavior or the movement of uh, solid atoms will change right so the flow of the atoms will be dictated by the energy gradient and the temperature okay so that is what we are going to talk about next and from there we can build on this theory and describe the effect of uh, temperature and time on the movement of the solid atoms toward the dislocation right so that is all i have for this particular lecture today but the rest of the things that we have on this particular topic will be taken up in the next lecture so don't forget to tune in and thank you for your attention.